Now, we come to a very interesting section which deals with the measurement of mass. Of course, before understanding what are the various techniques we use for measuring the masses, let us understand what actually the mass is. See, the mass of an object is a very special property about which uh, it is an intrinsic property of that object about which people have been wondering for the years. In Galileo's time, they used to have ships and they would use cannonballs to really attack the other ships. Okay, so in in his the in his days, <laughs> these were the things they used to to play with. And of course, it's no wonder that he proposed an experiment using just this. So he said that what happens if we take a cannonball and we dropped it from the mast top of the mast of a ship. So now, of course, you will say that if the ship is stationary, there is no problem. And they understood that if the ship is stationary, the ball would fall straight down and the person who is standing right at the bottom of the mast would be able to catch it. Now, what happens if this ship were not really stationary, but it were moving with a uniform speed of V in the forward direction? What would happen then? Now, in our common experience, we know that if I have a ball and I throw it up, it would come straight down. No matter whether I am doing this here in this stationary uh, room or I am doing this in a train. If, if I throw it up, it would come straight down. I don't really have to move my hand here and there if I'm sitting in a train moving with uniform velocity. The ball just comes straight down. That's what we know from our common experience and that's what they also thought. Galileo also, also said, but it was not so simple in those days. See, some people actually thought that what would happen is the ball would go down straight but the ship would actually move forward with the velocity v and therefore the ball would not reach the bottom of the mast but would actually fall behind that's what they thought some of the people okay but we did this experiment and they did it and and this this is not what happened so indeed the ball came straight down whether the ship was stationary or whether the uh, ship was moving with uniform velocity v from the perspective of this person who is he standing here at the bottom of the mast. The ball would just come straight down and he would be able to catch it. From the perspective of the person who is actually looking at the ball standing from the shore, from outside the boat, if there is a person like this who is standing there, what would he see? He would see that the ball actually did not go straight down. The ball traveled forward as well and continued with the velocity v in the forward direction as it was going down. So when the person on the top left it, the ball was compelled to continue to move in the forward direction with the speed v with which it was moving earlier when it was in contact with the boat. And what is this property of the body which is compelling it to do that? Right? That is what we understand in, from Newton's law of motion. There is a property of the body which forces it to remain at rest or to continue to move in uniform velocity until there is a force applied to it. And what is that property? We call it inertia, right? So very, very simple. See, we understand now that inertia is that property of the body which resists change in its velocity. And this is measured, this property inertia is measured using something known as inertial mass. Okay, it's a mass of the body. And this is how we write it from the Newton's laws. That's what it says that force, if I apply certain force to the body, if it's very massive, if it has a lot of inertial mass, then it would move with very less acceleration. That is, it would resist the change in its velocity even more. If the body has a small mass, then the resistance to the change in velocity would be less and therefore acceleration would actually be high. So very, very simple. Here is the term for you. The first one, inertial mass. Of course, <laughs> because we, we have given you a term, inertial mass. There is another term which is known as gravitational mass. Now, what is this? Let's just try to understand it. And why do we need two terms at all? See, here we have the force of gravitation. We know what the equation for this is. It is g m1 m2 upon r square. So what does this uh, really mean? It means that if we have two bodies, point objects, okay, these are point objects, their masses are m1 and m2 and the separation between them is r, then these bodies would experience a gravitational force equivalent equal to this value. Now the mass terms appearing in this force of gravitation 
are actually known as gravitational masses and these uh, actually describe the propensity of the body to generate or be attracted to in case of a gravitational uh, force okay so the higher the gravitational mass the greater the gravitational force the body would experience and the body would actually be able to generate so that this this notice that these two are completely different phenomena the inertia and the gravitational force and therefore the two masses are actually completely disjoint therefore what we say is there are two kinds of masses the gravitational mass and the inertial mass thanks to einstein and his theory of relativity we now know that these two masses happen to be equal and einstein actually gave us a reason uh, as to why they are actually e uh, equal this is described in another class and i believe you should definitely watch that class uh, as to why uh, these two forces are equal and this is the equivalence this is known as mass equivalence principle and this comes due to the theory of einstein's theory of relativity and you should watch the other class to really understand why this happens but to our relief now we only have to deal with one mass and this mass we call the mass of the object and it is responsible for, for both generating uh, interactions in the gravitational force as well as responsible for the inertia of the body now that we understand what mass is we can now look at some of the methods of measuring masses now this is the famous experiment what we have drawn here this is the famous experiment it is it was done by lord cavendish and this is known as the cavendish experiment and what was the objective of this experiment if you think about it what cavendish was trying to do is that we already knew at that time that the force of gravitation was equal to right if this these two masses right here they would experience the force of gravitation equal to this much right so there was there were two small masses right here which could rotate uh they were tied with a torsion wire but they could still rotate and why would they actually rotate they would rotate from their initial position to final position because of the force f which was the gravitational force exerted by this mass m so it would this would uh, turn it this way and this mass m would turn this uh, the small uh, red color ball this way okay so this Uh, forces together they would produce the uh, rotate the wire the, the torsion wire and this rotation would actually provide us the value of the force fg so in this experiment what he was able to do was he was able to determine the force of gravitation between these two masses he was able to determine the fg using the tension or the torsion in this uh, in this wire so cavendish was able to do that so once he knew what the value of fg was in this equation he knew the two masses and he of course also knew the separation between the two masses so with this he was able to determine the value of g actually quite accurately so this is the universal const uh, constant of gravitation and cavendish experiment was able to determine the value of g now the great thing about determining the value of g is as soon as we have the value of g we also have the mass of the earth we can also find out the mass of the earth and how is that see we know from this equation what the force of gravitation is on an object m here on the earth so this is the force of gravitation both of these sides describe the force of gravitation one in in terms of the acceleration and the other side describing the actual force of gravitation from coming from this equation now here m and m would cancel we knew the radius of the earth and we now know the value of g so we know this we know this and we also know this so from this equation we were able to determine the value of the what mass of the earth okay so this value of the mass of the earth actually became known from this experiment the cavendish's experiment and that is why this particular experiment is known as weighing the earth now of course when we as soon as we determine the mass of the earth we were able to also determine the mass of the moon because we knew the various orbital parameters of the moon and using those orbital parameters the centripetal force and the value of the centripetal force what it should be using those parameters the orbital parameters of the moon we were able to determine the mass of the moon and then so on and so forth we were able we are able to determine the masses of various other heavenly objects 
so when <laughs> cavendish was doing this experiment he uh, actually determined the value of g which then determined the value of mass of the earth so he weighed the earth in some sense not really weighed but he found out the mass of the earth and in turn found the mass of everything else as well so cavendish was actually brilliant because this this ex ex experiment we have discussed this in another class in great detail is actually very very brilliant the entire setup was very very nice so good and that this is the method that we use to find the uh, very large mass the celestial objects what their uh, masses would be now let's move on to measuring the small masses now what happens how do we measure the masses of very small atoms or or molecules i mean we cannot really even see them how do we even isolate those right so that's the th th that's the thing we use the uh, property of these bodies the the atoms and molecules that we can make them charged see what is charge see in general an atom has protons in the center and it has the same number of in the nucleus there are n number of protons and the charge is balanced by the n number of electrons which orbit around the, the nucleus that is the atomic models that we have studied another let there is another class on that so definitely go there in general that is the case but what happens if we knock out one of these electrons from the orbit we just knock it out we we apply force to it we apply something to it we use shoot laser beams do whatever but we <laughs> knock one of those electrons out then this entire atom or molecule will actually become charged now once it becomes charged then we have this very nice property that it will respond to electric and magnetic fields now that is a topic of uh, another uh, class we have classes on these as well but that is the thing that it once the atom or molecule it becomes charged then we can make it respond to electric and magnetic fields and that is the principle behind this instrument known as mass spectrograph which is used to measure the charges see what happens is that the electro molecule first enters the instrument that is what is being shown here so molecule enters the instrument uh, this molecule we apply some radiation to it we apply some laser to it we do something with it to knock out one of the electrons so notice that we could knock out more than one electrons but typically we only knock out one electron and if we know the charge of that electron so we know how much charge we have removed so we know how much charge is actually left here so this becomes an ion with a known charge okay if we if you know that for certain that we have knocked out one electron then we know that what is the charge of this molecule now or this atom now so charge is known notice that okay then this molecule undergoes uh some transformations in electrics and magnetic field of course those transformations we won't go into them now but we will discuss what happens when when charged objects move to electric and magnetic fields we will discuss that in separate uh, class and when the electron is subjected to this uh, when this uh, molecule the charged atom or molecule this ion is subjected to electric and magnetic fields its trajectory changes its path actually changes and it is the change in the path that we are able to measure okay so this change in the path we measure and using that we are able to determine the charge by mass ratio okay so that is the principle that we are able to determine the charge is q and mass of this ion is m we are able to determine that now since we already know what charge the the molecule has we have knocked out only one electron we are able to determine the mass of the electron absolutely but that is not the, the the only thing sometimes we are good only with determining the charge to mass ratio that is what is known as charge to mass ratio sometimes in some experiment that's all we need and in that case we are done but of course if we want to determine the mass we can do that too because we know the value of charge if we know the value of charge we can determine the mass and we are able to determine this due to the change in the trajectory which is being created by the electric and magnetic fields okay so this is the basic principle of mass spectrograph and using this we are able to measure very very small uh, masses to great accuracy so that is the thing now when we are talking about uh, small masses we come to another unit uh, we will we'll describe it here it is known as unified atomic mass unit now there is a word unified here it is very very important and why is it important because <laughs> before this uh, this unified atomic mass unit is actually uh, derived based on the mass of carbon mass of carbon similarly similar to our uh, mole uh, our carbon number okay so similar to that this unified atomic mass unit is actually derived based on the mass of carbon there was another unit before this which was atomic mass units just amu there was no <laughs> unified in front of this and that was actually given based on the mass of the 
uh, oxygen so we don't use that anymore so we whenever we de- whenever we say atomic mass unit we mean unified atomic mass unit and we denote it with a symbol of u okay so that is the symbol we use u okay we don't use the symbol a we use the symbol u and that is the unified atomic mass unit and it is based on the uh, mass of the carbon atom and very very simple we just say that the carbon mass of the carbon atom is 12 u that is it we have just declared it we have said carbon atom your mass is 12 u now everything else is actually based on the mass of this 12 u based on this that we have said that mass of the carbon atom is 12 that's what we have already said and everything else is based on this so if the carbon is 12 u hydrogen is 12 times less and that's what we say that hydrogen atom the weight is 1 u now there is a slight uh, bit of uh, problem here that uh, think about it okay we have said that carbon has six protons six neutrons and also six electrons okay so that is the the carbon the normal carbon okay the c12 of course there is also c13 and so on and so forth there are other isotopes of carbon as well but that is based on the c12 okay so we are only seeing using c12 here okay that is the first thing so we should just clarify that c12 okay now the problem with this saying that this is actually hydrogen is 1u this statement is slightly wrong why is that because we said that the carbon atom in totality with all its six protons six neutrons and six electrons would actually be 12u now proton and neutron are actually do not weigh the same their weights are slightly different they are roughly the same but their weights are slightly different so when we say that hydrogen has only one proton plus one electron okay so this is not due to normal hydrogen one electron okay so we cannot say that hydrogen is 12 times lighter than carbon that is not actually the case because the mass of proton and neutron are different the mass of electron is also less in the case of the hydrogen okay not only that but what happens typically is that when these six protons and neutrons they are isolated then they are individual like this when they are like this they are individual right they are just separate out so imagine that these are all protons and neutrons and they are just separate out here and there they are spread up, apart when they are their masses are different then when these protons and neutrons actually go inside the nucleus so when they go inside the nucleus we already know that there is a strong nuclear force there and because of that strong nuclear force when these protons and neutrons they collect inside the nucleus they lose some of their energy they lose some of their uh, sorry they lose some of their mass in the form of energy and that is known as binding energy so the mass of the carbon nucleus is slightly less than the mass of six protons plus six neutrons so that is very very important and because of this the mass of hydrogen is not really equal to exactly equal to 1u it is little bit different but of course we will not really care about it here we are just here to understand the uh, concept and the main concept is that the carbon atom we define its weight to be 12 atomic mass unit and everything else when we are saying that they have uh, um, uh, different masses in terms of atomic uh, mass unit we are comparing them to the weight of the one carbon atom and that is the concept of unified atomic mass unit so now you know it okay now of course in physics everything is not does not come very simply because the real world when we are trying to put it in numbers uh, although it fits really well in terms of number we are able to describe it very well in terms of number there are some complications which arise and we just have to be cognizant about those most of the times it does not matter if we if we take for some of our experiments for our calculations for doing some numericals if we take the mass of hydrogen in normal hydrogen h uh, the normal hydrogen okay not deuterium if we take the the mass of this that particular atom to be 1 u it won't really affect our calculations okay but we just have to be cognizant that oh it's not really 1 u it is slightly different than 1 u the only atom whose mass is uh, whose mass is actually equal to an integer in terms of the unified atomic mass unit is carbon because it has been defined that way all other atoms have fractional masses uh, when it come comes to the atomic mass unit now here is the range of masses that we observe in our galaxy so the range of masses goes from the highest to mass of the universe to the lowest mass of the electrons and even below that uh, it can go but you can appreciate it it's now 
and now with this we end this uh, chapter uh, this topic about uh, mass but of course at this point uh, we would like to tell you that in the next class if you look at the next class from this series of lectures you will find a couple of numericals that we have solved so definitely go through those numericals which are based on masses it will be easy to to find they'll give you an idea about what kinds of questions can be asked when we are talking about the masses okay so so very very uh, important thank you